during today's uh, public lecture. Uh, Professor Diamond has a long and distinguished career in astronomy spanning more than 30 years, which started back in 1982 when he completed his PhD at the University of Manchester. Uh, he worked for some time at the Onsala Space Observatory in Sweden and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany before moving to the US to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory for a period of uh, 12 years. Uh, there he was the deputy director uh, of the NRAO's uh, VLA and VLBA uh, before moving back to the UK in 1999. Uh, in UK, uh, he was for several years the director of the Jodl Bank Center for Astrophysics, uh, which is part of the University of Manchester, uh, with the responsibility for the operation of the giant Lovell Telescope and also the E. Merlin VLBI National Facility in the UK. Uh, then, uh, for two years, from 2010 to 2012, he was the chief of CSIRO's <coughs> Astronomy and Space Sciences which operates uh, all the major astronomy facilities in Australia. Um, in October 2012, he was appointed the Director General of the SKA. Yeah. And uh, today, um, he uh, leads uh, the team doing the most uh, challenging and also the most interesting uh, task uh, as far as radio astronomers are concerned, which is of designing and ultimately constructing the SKA, which when completed will be the largest scientific facility on Earth. And that is what uh, Professor Diamond is going to uh, tell us about. Uh, so, uh, welcome, Phil Diamond. Thank you very much, Ashwan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, to be talking to you this evening, especially the, uh, the young students. I understand there are quite a few students here. And uh, it's especially a, a pleasure to be talking to you because uh, it, it's subjects such as astronomy that I, that I hope inspires the young students uh, to take up science and engineering. And uh, you're the people who will develop uh, mega science facilities like the SKA, and be the users for a, a facility that um, we, hopeful, we, we are hopeful will be operational for 50 years. I'm afraid I, I may not be around uh, to, to see the, the array decommissioned, but I do hope to be, uh, to, to be around when uh, we start delivering science. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, uh, the square kilometer array, the, uh, the science that it may do, I want to put it in the context of, uh, of what astronomy might look like um, in the coming decades. And it's a, it's a very exciting time for astronomy. There are some major facilities being built around the world. Uh, and to, to be a young person entering the field at this time, I think is, uh, you know, they're, they're, you're gonna have a very exciting time over the coming decades. So, The universe is, uh, is full of stars. If we go out into the, in, uh, at night and look up at the night sky, admittedly not here in the center of Pune, um, out, out where there are no street lights, you can see something like this. And this is a truly spectacular image showing the, uh, the galactic plane, the two Magellanic clouds. This is actually a southern hemisphere view of the uh, of the sky, but it really shows uh, what what the uh, the sky looks like um, very dramatically. However, that's wrong. The universe is actually full of gas. This is a view um, of of uh, of that same sky. If you could see, if your eyes could see the radio emission from hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. And it emits uh, a radio wave uh, with a wavelength of about 21 centimeters. Now, I'll come back to hydrogen later, uh, but it, it's, it's really very important for the SKA that, uh, that you bear in mind. It is designed to observe hydrogen 
all the way back to the dawn of the universe. So this is what a radio telescope can see now. And you can see here the galactic plane uh, is much thicker in hydrogen than you see it in stars. The Magellanic clouds are connected with a, a, a bridge of hydrogen there. So the sky looks very different when you look with, ra with radio eyes. But actually, even that's wrong. The, the vast majority of the universe is made up of, of, of unknown material. This is a pie chart showing that uh, the material of which stars and, and gas are made, the so-called baryonic material, only makes up about 5% of the energy density of the universe. About just over 25% is the mysterious dark matter. That uh, we, we know dark matter exists. We can see it when we use our radio telescopes to look at, uh, at hydrogen in, in galaxies, other galaxies other than the Milky Way. Uh, we, could, we can trace the, uh, the rotation curve of, of the galaxies. We can actually weigh the galaxies. And what we see is that there are, the galaxies are heavier than we would deduce just by looking at the optical light. And that difference is presumed to be dark matter. But then, of course, there's the mysterious dark energy. This was discovered um, in, in, the, uh, in the, the, the 1990s. Uh, the discoverers received the Nobel Prize for that work uh, just a couple of years ago. And it makes up six, almost 69% of the energy density of the universe. And, Dark energy is a, is a mysterious force that, are, that, that is making uh, the galaxies which are receding from each other accelerate. So the universe is getting faster. It's accelerating uh, more quickly. And so we, we astronomers have been careless because it, in, the early, in the 1980s, early 1990s, we presumed we knew most of what the universe uh, consisted of. But this is our picture now. And so what we have to do is try and understand these, these constituents of the universe. And it needs a new generation of telescopes uh, to enable us to do that. So we have come a long way, though, in our technology. This is a picture of Galileo over 400 years ago, Galileo's telescope. I think this is uh, possibly the Pope um, actually uh, looking through it. I think this is Galileo. Um, these, these were the first crude optical telescopes. In fact, uh, uh, the modern telescopes that we, the public, can buy are very similar to this. But we have come a long way in terms of our technology. We can now shoot lasers into the sky from enormous optical telescopes on mountain tops in, in Chile. This is a real picture. This is the... Uh, a very large telescope, the VLT. You'll have to excuse us astronomers, we don't do very well in inventing acronyms for our, our telescopes. Uh, you'll, you'll hear a few more as I go through the talk. So this is the VLT, the very large telescope, and that is a real picture of a laser being shot into the sky. The purpose of that laser is to correct the distortions of the image because of the, the, uh, the flickering atmosphere uh, above the sky. So it makes sharper images. But that shows the advance in, in technology over the last 400 years. Now, I want to give you a little bit of physics. You need to know something about the electromagnetic spectrum to understand the context of what we're talking about. So since Galileo's time, uh, really, really until about 60 years, 60 or 70 years ago, our view of the universe was limited to a tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light going from blue to red. Now, as you go from blue to red, the wavelength increases. And that, as you go the other way, the energy increases. But that this, this is just a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you look at the whole spectrum, it goes from radio waves, which are long wavelengths, small energy, 
all the way to gamma rays, which are very short wavelengths, large energy. As I said, the hydrogen line uh, has a wavelength of about 21 centimeters. So it sits here. Uh, at the, at the, the top end of the radio spectrum, we have what we call the millimeter, submillimeter area. And I'll show you a picture of a telescope that observes there in a moment. Then we have the infrared region of the spectrum, this tiny slice, which our eyes is sensitive to, the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, X-rays and gamma rays. Here, the primary way to observe uh, uh, those wavelengths is using spacecraft sitting above the atmosphere. The atmosphere tends to absorb the electromagnetic uh, radiation here. But down here, we can observe from the ground, uh, also from space as well, um, in certain circumstances. So, to put things in context, this is uh, the, uh, the, the large, one of the large optical telescopes that is being planned for the next decade. This is the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. I told you we're not very good at acronyms. In fact, it's, the, it's descended uh, from a telescope, an even larger one, which was, would, have, would have had a mirror 100 meters across, which was called OWL, the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope. So this is the ELT. The mirror there will be 39 meters in diameter. You can see cars down here to give you a sense of the scale of, uh, of what our, our colleagues at the European Southern Observatory are planning to build. Construction is approved uh, and uh, I understand that the, the clearing of the mountain top in Chile will begin next year. This shows you the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, the ELT will address. It's primarily visible light and some infrared radiation. ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, this operates in the millimeter submillimeter end of the spectrum. This is the high, uh, the small wavelength end of the radio spectrum. This is now uh, in, in the early stages of operation. It, it is the final stages of construction. It six, consists of 66 uh, antennas, most of which are 12 meters in diameter, on the Chajnantur Plateau in Chile, at an altitude of 17,000 feet. It's very difficult to work up here. The partial pressure of oxygen significantly re reduced. The people who work up there have to wear oxygen masks. It was inaugurated on the 13th of March uh, this year, and as I said, it's beginning operations now. So it operates uh, at the top end of the radio spectrum. It, it sits uh, at 17,000 feet because the atmosphere becomes opaque even at the, at the top end of the radio spectrum. So it's in some senses, it, it, it's, it's like an optical telescope uh, in, in that it needs to sit above most of the atmosphere. James Webb Space Telescope, being built by NASA and some partners, is due for launch in 2018. It's uh, an infrared telescope. Uh, it's the replacement for the Hubble Space Telescope, except it won't be in low Earth orbit, it won't be accessible to astronauts to undertake uh, repair uh, and, and maintenance miss missions. It will be in, a, uh, in an orbit out, a uh, similar orbit to the moon at a point called L2. And the fourth of these, this cornerstone of major facilities for the 21st century is the SKA, which is what I'm going to talk about now, Square Kilometre Array. This is a radio telescope, and we hope that construction will start towards the end of 2017, early 2018. And it covers uh, a major portion, or it will when complete, a major portion of the radio spectrum. So those four facilities together will cover most of the spectrum available from the ground and will provide a fantastic complementary set of telescopes to enable astronomers, 
uh, scientists of other persuasions as well to, to observe the universe, the ionosphere, the atmosphere, the sun. Be a fantastic uh, and, and very advanced set of facilities. So what is the SKA? Well, if you go to Google and you type SKA and you look at the images that are returned, this is what you see. Now, most of these come from the SKA music genre, ska, which my son may know something about, but I know very little. However, sitting down here <laughs> is the SKA logo. Now, my aim, and I think the aim of many of my colleagues, is to get this logo up here, and we will achieve that. So what's the scientific motivation for us to build the SKA? I've told you about these facilities. In order for us to receive the funding to, to build such, uh, th such major telescopes, we need to provide to our funders, the government, and to persuade our colleagues that there is a strong science case uh, for, for, for spending hundreds of millions, even billions uh, of euros on, on such, uh, such facilities. So let me give you a, a very brief uh, tour through the universe. This is a very nice cartoon um, put together uh, by, uh, I can never pronounce that, Jorgovsky of, uh, of Caltech, which uh, shows the universe from the Big Bang to now. 13.8 billion years. So there's the Big Bang. Um, about a billion years or so in, uh, the first stars started to be formed. These are the so-called Population 3 stars. I don't know why they aren't called the Population 1. Well, I do, but that's another lecture. Um, so these, these are the first and oldest stars in the universe. They gradually formed uh, groupings, were attracted to each other, galaxies evolved. Uh, this is a particular, particularly interesting part of the universe where the, the, the neutral gas that had emerged after the Big Bang had settled down was reionized. It was reionized by all of the ultraviolet radiation given off by these, these early stars and these proto galaxies. Uh, this is one of the, the key science goals of the SKA, is to uncover uh, the, the signature of this so-called epoch of reionization, when the universe became transparent again. So at this point, galaxies started to, to form and to evolve. <coughs> the solar system was formed after about, about 9 billion years after the Big Bang. So in terms of the scale of the universe, the age of the universe, the solar system is, is still a relative newcomer. And of course, we humans have been around for a time that is equivalent to a microscopically thin line across the bottom of this scale. I haven't worked it out, but potentially that line would be an atom or, thin, or, or two uh, of thickness. So it is arrogant, really, of us humans to think that we can understand this, this universe. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out where we came from, how we, how we got to where we're here, how the, how the universe evolved to the state in which it is, and also whether we are alone. And it, I, I really hope that the SKA will be able to address many of those questions. So in the 20th century, with the facilities we had available then, we discovered our place in the universe. But in the 21st century, it is our intention to understand the universe that we inhabit. So these are the, the key science goals of the SKA. On this side, we will be addressing fundamental forces. This is fundamental physics. The SKA is not just for astronomers. It is a physics machine the 21st century. It will be able to, to provide deep insights on two of the four fundamental forces. Gravity. 
be able to do this using pulsars. Pulsars are the remnants of massive stars that exploded. As they exploded, uh, they, they, what remained was a dense core of material that was spinning rapidly, strong magnetic fields. The, uh, the, the diameter of the core is 10, 12 kilometers. So, so maybe imagine an air, uh, uh, something the size of Pune rotating hundreds of times a second, e even uh, possibly a thousand times a second. Uh, that, that's how fast these things are, 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 are rotating. They also emit beams of radio emission. So it's like a lighthouse. As the pulsar rotates, that beam of emission sweeps past the Earth and we can detect it. They are the most accurate clocks in the universe. And by using pulsars as, as clocks, we can test Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity. We can search for gravitational waves. Uh, and uh, these are, this is one of the key science areas uh, of the SKA. We will also, not using pulsars, but using other techniques, explore dark energy. And this will also reveal some of the mysteries of, of, of gravity. Magnetism, cosmic magnetism, it's all pervasive in the universe. We don't really understand its influence on the things we observe, its origin. Uh, and the, but the SKA will be the tool by which we can explore cosmic magnetism. So that's fundamental physics on this side. On this side, more astronomical questions, looking at our origins, the origins of galaxies, the, the cosmic dawn, the first galaxies, how they assemble, how they evolve. Stars, planets, and even life. The SKA, uh, at, with its higher frequencies, will be able to, to probe the formation of planetary disks. These are disks of, of, of gas, dust, boulders, uh, which eventually form planets. We'll be able to, uh, to observe the, the molecular signature of biomolecules. First amino acids have been uh, detected in, in space. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, which, which are the building blocks of us. So the SKA will actually probe, enable us to, to detect many more of these, uh, the, these molecular signatures. And we need the huge sensitivity the SKA will deliver to enable us to, uh, to, to detect these weak signals. And of course, one of the things that uh, we're also interested in pursuing is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So uh, this, this whole origin theme is, is a core, part of the core science case of the SKA. I'm now going to show you a, a little movie which lasts for a couple of minutes, which introduces the SKA and gives you a brief tour of the key science cases. There is some music, but I'll, I'll talk over the music. So it's useful to have the music as a background. So we could turn the music on. So the SKA will be the largest Australian telescope in the world, located in Australia and Southern Africa. I'll describe more about the technology in a moment. The distance will be 15 meters across. This is what the, uh, the, the radio sky looks like. This is a survey of the galactic sun. This is a simulation of, uh, of the, how the first black hole the stars form. Simulation of how the, the stars and the galaxies began to assemble. And it's what we might be able to observe with the SKA as we look back in time. In the, uh, the galaxy that we, as we see the universe looking now. So understanding how galaxies are evolved and understanding what dark energy really is, what is this mysterious force 
of pushing the ice cream the universe uh, apart. That will be addressed uh, at lower frequencies, looking at hydrogen as well as dipole energy. We want to know if Einstein was right about gravity. We will be able to use a network of pulsars to detect the ripples in cosmic space time as, uh, uh, as a gravitational wave passing across the Earth. These it, it, two black holes merging and throwing out uh, a gravitational wave which can be detected across the universe. This is a special type of technology uh, that's called dense aperture arrays that will be part of the second phase of SKA, uh, which won't, won't appear until towards the end of the next decade. With the second phase of the SKA, both dishes and the aperture arrays, we will observe cosmic magnetism and try and understand its origin and its effect of galaxy. This is a, a movie of a, of a protoplanetary disk forming, new planets around young stars. And then of course we want to address the question, are we alone? We saw the spectral signature of biomolecules flash up on us. So that's the, the, the very weak signals that we wish to explore. That gives you a, a sense of the range of the science that we'll be uh, exploring with the SKA. The question is, how will we do that? Currently, this is the best radio telescope on Earth. It's the, uh, the very large array in New Mexico, in the United States. It consists of 27 25 meter antennas. It's just been upgraded, uh, but it, it's, it produces an enormous range of science, an enormous uh, number of publications, and uh, it really is the, the best on Earth. For the SKA to have great impact, we have to significantly improve on the, on the VLA. Of course, here in India, you have the giant meter wave radio telescope, which uh, is, is a, the, a low frequency telescope, very complementary to, to the VLA. And the reason we're having this conference here is to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the GMRT, which is producing fantastic science. An interesting thing about the GMRT these 45 meter dishes, 30 of them, if you add up their collecting area, they're equivalent to 5% of the collecting area of the SKA. So instruments like the GMRT are doing some of the science that the SKA will do, uh, but of course the greater sensitivity of the SKA will take that science further. So what is the project? What we want to build is a large radio telescope to undertake the transformational science I've just shown you in that movie. We will build technologies that will deliver up to a million square meters of collecting area. It won't be a monolithic single dish. It will be many dishes, like the VLA, like the GMRT, although slightly smaller, but distributed over an area, uh, a huge, huge area, up to 3,000 kilometers maximum separation of antennas. And the reason we want to do that is we want to observe the finest details of the radio sources in the distant universe. The further apart we make our antennas, they act like a zoom lens. The antennas are close together, like you saw in the picture of the VLA, that acts as a wide angle lens. In fact, the VLA antennas sit on railway tracks so it could be either a wide angle or a bit of a zoom lens. But we want to have a, a major zoom lens for the, the SKA. We will operate frequencies from, actually that should be 50 megahertz, uh, up to about 10 gigahertz. And I'll come back to this, but the, the key to why we can build the SKA now is that digital processing, modern telecommunications, modern electronics, enables us to cope with the torrents of data that the SKA will provide. <coughs> so when complete, the SKA will deliver 50 times the sensitivity of the current world's best radio telescope. 
That's the VLA and uh, instruments like the GMRT. And up to a million times the survey speed. Uh, that, that is our ability to survey the sky. We'll be able to do it very quickly, very often. And that's one of the keys to delivering the SKA science goals. So the SKA components are summarized in this slide. You saw the movie, which, uh, which uh, took you through some of these components. So in this summary, you can imagine us moving from Africa on this side across to Australia. In Africa, and I'll describe in a moment, uh, there is um, a precursor array called Meerkat being built by our South African colleagues. We will be adding SKA dishes. This is the, uh, the current preferred design for the SKA dishes. We're in the middle or at the, at the early stages of the design phase for the SKA. In Australia, our Australian colleagues have built the Australian SKA Pathfinder, which consists of 12 meter symmetric dishes that look like this. But there will also be dishes in Australia. In addition, you see here a field of dipoles. They, they look like uh, metal Christmas trees. Um, that's our preferred design. I'll, I'll have a, a better picture in a moment. And in phase two in Africa, we will have these things called the dense aperture array. So this is uh, an attempt to summarize the various technologies of the SKA in one slide. This is a, another way of looking at it. Across the bottom here is the observing frequency with the, uh, the various key science goals which approximately map to the observing frequency. There's significant overlap, so uh, you know, don't, don't take this uh, entirely at face value. But in phase one, where we expect science to be delivered in 2020, we will have these uh, low frequency aperture arrays in Australia covering this frequency range. We will have dishes in South Africa covering this frequency range and dishes with special survey technology in Australia also covering the same frequency range. The capital cost for phase one will be 650 million euros. That is the amount of money uh, we, we hope the governments will provide for us to build this technology. In phase two, which is a factor of nine larger, phase one will be approximately 10% of the SKA, phase two will be the remaining 90%. We will increase the size of the aperture arrays in Australia. We will build these dense aperture arrays in Africa. And the plan is to expand the number of dishes to two and a half thousand across the Af African continent and to cover the full frequency. We have not 